thank you for the introductions. Very, uh, I'm, I'm very honored to be here and the Rachel Kassen Center. And thank you for audience, professors and students. And um, I'm really happy to have you here to listen to this topic. This is something from, uh, part from, uh, partially from my dissertation topic and partially from some research I did here that the past one and a half months and uh, I'm trying to do something new and uh, here I'm trying to share some topic with you and uh, let's begin. Uh, as a Chinese, a Chinese philosopher, Meng Sirs, once said, people can live without fire and water. And uh, we have a very ancient book called Shang Shu. And in that book, uh, written uh, the invention of wells uh, first uh, by a boy, a people. Then the city uh, shows up. So the two old sayings uh, gave us, uh, the shows us the tight relations between uh, water and the city in China. So <laughs> it's undeniable that cities rely on water, but um, uh, where they get their water and why they make or change their choice and what is the effect? Uh, those questions are further relation, uh, further relationship between, uh, but also relationship between resources and the city that interest me very much and also are the names, are the aims of this uh, topic. And here I will have four stories from Tianjin in different times and to explain the changing of water choice. So before that, uh, we can have a quick look at the city we are talking about. So <coughs> here's Tianjin. Tianjin is in Hubei uh, region and uh, it's a neighbor city of Beijing, the capital city. And uh, it's the two cities are very uh, close and by a fast train only 30, 30 minutes connect direction, uh, um, 30 minutes distance. It's um, a mega city with about uh, over 15 million people living there. And uh, uh, area covered an area of um, 10,000 square meters. Uh, it is the biggest uh, international post city yeah, here. It's a post city. And uh, by the same time, uh, the economic center of North China. The GDP growth rate of Tianjin last year is 9.4 percentage. So it's quite fast. And uh, by the same time, it's on uh, the front place of water shortage cities in China. So it's kind of strange. How could a city suffering that severe water resource uh, problem and then still can keep growing at a very high speed? And to answer that question, I think we should uh, return to the old times then start from Ming Dynasty, I guess. But um, this is a mother. This is a mother river of Tianjin called uh, Haihe, and uh, Haihe is very famous for the very short uh, mainstream and a uh, lot of upstreams, very strong upstream, and a lot of water coming down from to this very short mainstream. And uh, because of light, you know, usually in Chinese in China uh, in Chinese northern cities, they um, the water shortage problem were very common. But uh, because of all of upstream rivers, it makes Tianjin a city uh, famous for the water around it. There are a lot of swamps and the rivers you can get anywhere. But the water is also a problem because it's the land between the river and uh, the sea. So it's, the river is salted. And also the city is located on a very low plain as the altitude is below 10 meters. So that's why uh, the shallow underground water is all salted. And uh, <clears throat> here, is, so here, you know, the small square in the middle is the uh, old square the city of Tianjin, which <laughs> was first built in 1404 and by the emperor. And the emperor gave it the name because it's, uh, it's a name, the meaning is a fairy of sand of heaven. It's a fairy, fairy place. So the name means the city is closely related with water. And uh, also, uh, since, so 
water inside of the city is very salted. The people, they try to dig wells, but they hardly can get anything to drink. And we saw in the documents in Qianlong period, about 1664, there are only five wells recorded in that city. And like legendary wells can supply drinkable water. But by the end, after the, uh, in the afterward uh, documents, we can't find no more wells, new wells could be found in that city. And uh, that's why, last time, people living in Tianjin, they use river resource instead of well resource. And people prefer to live along the rivers, not instead of living inside. Even they have world, but uh, they prefer to the living convenience. And uh, they also, you see, there are several branches over there. But, uh, the people have a source to think this branch, the source canal, is the best uh, water resource because the water tastes good. Like uh, they describe that it's sweet water. And also, uh, it, um, it is comparatively clear. So here is the uh, only better water can be get. And uh, how about other people living in other parts of the city? So a new occupation appeared in that period and uh, that's called the water carrier. And the water carriers have already seen the pushing the cart with the three wheels or two wheels, sometimes were drawn by, were drew by animals. And they travel from the, the river, especially the South Canal, because uh, that part of river water is in have higher price than other parts. So, <coughs> they transfer the water from the South Canal to local citizens. And because of the transportation, very busy, the road, the Euro road, they used as a, always muddy, even in the sunny day. And they transfer the water sometimes to the household, sometimes to water shops. That's also an invention there to hold the water. And anytime you can come there, you can buy water, even uh, warm water. Uh, you can buy river water or warm water or cold water, anything you can, you, you can think about. And uh, that's the first story about the old city and uh, why they choose the river water. And uh, then comes the concession area. The first concession appeared in Tianjin is in 1860. And this British concession, you can see the largest uh, green one on the bottom side. And uh, that's, that's the time at the first, uh, the first of foreigners come to Tianjin, they feel the water is undrinkable because uh, you, they have the modern sanit uh, sanitation ideas about uh, water. And when they see the Tianjinese taking directly water from the river, to drink, they are terrified, especially during the plague uh, time, and uh, they think it's totally unhealthy. But uh, how can they get their own water? They have three ways. First way is to buy water from Chinese water carriers, or they can hire Chinese servants to do the water carrying job. But uh, the problem is they can't trust the Chinese. There's one time a people said, a uh, foreigner living there. I saw my servant leaked on my plate and polished with the clothes, washing, wash clothes and, uh, to make it clean. And I, I, no, I can no longer trust him to bring anything back to my house. So uh, they are pursue a uh, liquid independent in the concession area because that time the, that part are totally isolated from the Chinese part. And how could they do that? Um, so there are two other uh, options. The first one is that they can use the Min River, oh, the Min River here. You see the river coming down from here. And uh, they can take the Min River water. But uh, the problem is the Chinese city is here. So it's downstream of Chinese city. And uh, that means a lot of sewage coming from China part will arrive them. I write to them, and uh, that's totally unhealthy. Um, so if they are going to use the river water, they need the very better water treatment. 
and the uh, water factory, of course. Then the third choice is um, they need wells. But uh, you know, in Tianjin, you can, you can never get um, the shallow water wells water to drink. So that's the time, the technique, and the experience in Australia, the deep water drilling technique. And uh, they have also experienced that. That one uh, did it in Shanghai in 1890. So their experience and technique support the uh, concession area to dig their own uh, deep ground water uh, possible, possibly. Uh, so there is a little debate between water, real water or well water, deep well water, that time. And, um, the, the, deep, the deep ground water is clear, of course, and sometimes you don't need to produce it. Then can directly drink it because it's so clear and clean. But uh, the problem is um, in Tianjin, no one did it before. So the British concession is the first one to thinking about, uh, to pursue the liquid independent. And um, it uh, also takes them a while to think about, uh, did it or not? to dig the well. So they waited, waited until 1928. It's a year French concession failed there in their uh, boiling well experience. So they think maybe boring water could not become true in Tianjin. So they built up their own uh, water factory in 1928. So after several years, um, after several years, uh, there are severe water crises happened along Haikou River, so they returned back to dig wells. And uh, then that, that time, technique can support them enough, and uh, that was success. And in seven years, in seven years, they drilled uh, nine wells, and uh, the water production is enough to meet the whole concession area for one time. And in 1932, there, uh, uh, there's a, yes, and there the, the fund of deep, the use of deep uh, uh, the groundwater, deep groundwater using wells in China also uh, opened a new era in Tianjin to use the groundwater. <clears throat> and uh, even the concession area is separated from Chinese area, the, the, the technique is spread very fast. So Chinese learned it. And, uh, the Chinese first uh, water factory was founded in 1903, and uh, after light in, 30, in 1930s, they uh, wide, wide the drilling technique was widely used, especially in rural area in, in the Tianjin, and still they are there now. And. Uh, so. That's the concession area and what they bring to Tianjin, the technique, and how to explore more water resource and to gain more to uh, suspend the, the expand of the city. And then we go to a new period. This is a period I called uh, to take water under control. And uh, this is uh, after 1949. And uh, in the early 50s, Tianjin is the second big, biggest uh, industrial city in China. So it's very, very important. And a lot of the population there need water to drink. But still, they're facing water problem. That's why, that time, the central government think we should make good use of water. And uh, still, because of a lot of population there, they need food. And the food production needs water. So in the drought days, how could they do when the water, real water not enough? So that's the time the government encouraged people to drill deep, especially deep ground water in rural area to increase food production. And the big, it's, a, it's a dilemma that in Tianjin, that time, a lot of people living there and the very, uh, very uh, developed in and compared developed in industrial uh, parts in China. But still, they can't feed themselves. The food production is not enough. So they are thinking about transfer the food from south is 
with a lot, so they encourage people to agriculture to devoted in agriculture and uh, then to feed themselves. So it depends on the what value drilling they did it, they success, successfully did it. In the uh, 1970s, the first uh, 74 is the first year they can feed themselves and they even have something to spare. So it's a great successful for them to do by the drilling. And also to tame the river is another great task. And uh, in the 50s, <coughs> they built a lot of small reservoirs upstream of Taihe River, just for the water supply for the city, big city, Tianjin and Beijing. But uh, uh, after that, in 1963, there are um, severe, uh, very bad uh, flood happened to Taihe River Basin. And uh, that's the reason the government decided to, like this, take a, a we must bring Haihe River under permanent control. It's uh, a sentence given by Chairman Mao Zedong. And uh, since the chairman seeing it, the people uh, just uh, doing it. About uh, 100,000 people joined the project of taming Haihe. And this project lasted for 17 years and completed in 1980s. 1980 is the year completed. But um, during this project, they, are, they feel another thing, another problem showing off, uh, showed off. It's uh, the drought. When they are doing the taming, they are just uh, trying to give every branches of Haihe River its own way to go to the sea instead of running to the short mean stream to stop the flood, but uh, weakened the capacity of the river to hold the water. So that's the time and it showed up, the problem showed up in 1970s, I'm 72. That's no water to drink. And even because of all the drilled wells there, the underground water has gone very fast, and there is underground funnel in, in Huabei province, the biggest one. And no more water can be draw, can be drew from underground, uh, underground. And also, no water from the river. So where should we get the resource to save the people living there? And uh, we are approaching to the next step, the boring water period. And um, the first idea to borrow water comes from Chairman Mao Zedong in 1970s, in, in, in 1950s. And he, he, see, he visited Haihe, uh, Huabei province, which a lot of rural area short of water, and visited Yangtze River and see they are rich of water and sometimes flood too often. And he said, could we borrow some water from the Yangtze River? And uh, those scientists, they are thinking about it, but uh, it's only a plan. And to solve the problem, waited for a long time. But uh, in 1970, it's um, the first uh, water crisis, and uh, water shortage happened in Huabei province. Like by that time, nobody can borrow Yangtze River's water. So where should we get the water? And the Yellow River is a closed one. And so Yellow Water is the first river we borrowed for 14 times from 1972 to 2004. And uh, because Yellow River is uh, severe polluted, so every borrowing, uh, borrowing water uh, action only lasts for a short time and only at emergency. So to solve the problem still need some time. And in 1982, there a very severe water shortage happened in Tianjin that um, no one can drink drinking water as a, people lack of drinking water and the power, power plant was shut up and all the factories closed and the people can only hold the baskets to 
waiting in a line to get a certain amount of drinking water from a certain place. And the last time the central government think we should do a project as soon as possible, let's um, the borrow river, um, the water diversion from Huaihe River to, um, to Tianjin, that's a project name. And the Huaihe River is uh, to the south of Taihe, and it's very good river, rich of water resources. So uh, because of the need, uh, water need in Tianjin is very, is very uh, in, uh, in emergency, so the project have, be, have, to, have to be completed as soon as possible. And uh, if we do it in a uh, in you know, normal speed, it will cost uh, 17 years. It's too long. No one can wait for that long. So, a lot of so the 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 the, the, the central government encouraged every people to join that project, and uh, they finished that one astonishingly in two years. And the 21 people died in that project, but finally they divert the river from Luanghe to Tianjin and uh, in 1984. So that's the year people finally can drink unsalted water because, there's, because of the water shortage in 1980s in Tianjin, because of the underground, and the underground water shortage, the seawater come into the river, and uh, there's a saying like, uh, there's a strange thing in Tianjin, running water can make pickles. So you can see this is a celebration of the water from Luanghe arrived in Tianjin. And the people are so happy, they think it's the end of their water shortage. And they think, finally, I will no longer uh, drink uh, salty water. But uh, at last, uh, the profits from Luanghe River last uh, not very long. In 2002, the, the Luanghe River have the reservoir in Luanghe River, which is the north end of this transfer project, left only three percentage of the water in the reservoir. So no longer they can give any more water to Tianjin. And the Tianjin still in emergency of water, so why, what? And then they return to Yellow River. That's why the last one we borrowed from Yellow River in 2004. And still, Yellow River is short of water. Wulanghe River is short of water. And uh, so maybe the future for solution is uh, from Yangtze River. This is the pe people taking taste of Wulanghe River water because it's so sweet. And uh, this is a project we call it uh, South Water to North project. This is uh, the largest one in China, maybe in the world. And they have three lines. The first line is uh, the west line the here, and from upstream Yangtze River to upstream Yellow River. And uh, the middle line is here, from Hanjiang, Fanjiang Kou Reservoir to Tianjin and Beijing. And uh, the east one is here, from downstream Yangtze River along the old Great Canal to Tianjin and then to Beijing. You see the two lines joint in Tianjin and Beijing. And uh, you know, the eastern line is the hard, hard, hardest one to build because they have to use uh, 13 star pumps to pump the water from south to north. And the middle line is the easiest one and the safe, most safe one because uh, it's, um, they have the altitude difference or in 43, 43 meters. So it's easy for the water to automatically uh, flow from south to north. And also because of the, in the middle dream, the water is less polluted. And the latter land finished last year. And the finally, we drink uh, Yangtze River water by the Spring Festival of, 19, of, of to, to, to 20, 2015. And it's a cheerful thing for Tianjin. But uh, also, 
uh, problem from what I see. And uh, I like this picture very much. Uh, this picture took uh, from the old uh, three river junction. And uh, you can see the monument people built in memory of those people doing great feat, great job to transfer Luanghe River to Tianjin. And uh, from this view, you see Tianjin have a lot of water like it all used to be. But still, we are short of water. So let's think about this question. In the different stages of Tianjin, we can find the choice of water resources. More and more depend on human power, and which is enhanced with modern technology. And uh, we use it to get water to survive, but now we use water to develop. And uh, there is surely a immediate um, there is surely a limitation of water for city. And the, but we see the limitation like, as an obstacle. And uh, the, li the limitation of, of resources restrain us from develop. So we break it all the time and trying to develop. And the, the, the city grew bigger and bigger, but uh, it's bigger the better. And how big should the city be in the future? As um, in one famous Chinese novel called uh, A Journey to the West, and in that novel, there is um, a monkey king and who don't want to obey his master. And his master have, can do nothing to restrain him. So the Buddha gave the master a golden hoop and put it on the monkey king's head and uh, told, the, told the master uh, in Cajun. And when he read it, the, tight, the, the hoop will be will tied up and uh, the monkey will suffer because of a headache. And the monkey king tried to get off of the hoop, but uh, he failed all the time. And until he finished his our journey and obeyed everything. Yeah, and sometimes he forgot about the hoop. And then that's the time he completed his spiritual uh, practice. And then the hoop gone. So that remains uh, uh, some similar meaning here. We can see the resource, the natural resource, as an obstacle, or as a sign of a limitation, of a scale of city. So when we arrive there, we see the sun, we stop. If we trying to break the, if we trying to break the limitation, it's like the Monkey King breaking the golden hoop. And if we, if we can obey the natural law, then maybe the hoop could be a crown and we can make good use of the resource. And um, because I'm very nervous, and maybe I forgot something to say, <laughs> and uh, it could be very short if something severe, uh, something strange happened. <laughs> but uh, if you have further questions, I will happy to answer.